Hello and welcome back to Foreign Correspondence. I'm Moon Gun Young and it's the fourth week of October. And again, I'm joined by a wonderful panel of foreign journalists today. Welcome to the program. Good to be back again. Social media platforms such as YouTube and Facebook and Twitter have become a prominent source of news and public discourse in recent years, broadening its influence in the political sphere as well. On this week's edition of Foreign Correspondence, we sit down with our panel of foreign journalists to talk more about social media's growing impact on politics. Now, South Korea's media landscape is undergoing a tectonic shift. According to a local survey in 2018, more people are now using online media as their primary news source away from the traditional media such as television, radio and newspapers. Now, ask journalists, how are you adopting the new era of digital journalism? I mean, has it brought significant changes in the way you prepare for your reports and the way you report? Yes, indeed. I mean, I, I do radio, but now all the scripts my radio scripts are published online, so when I write a story that will be aired, I have to now to, I mean, I, I like doing that, but I have to include links, uh, web links, and uh, like something to be read. And it changed a little bit the way I write sometimes. And what changes as well is that um, there is more feedbacks. Uh, for example, when I write a K-pop stories, in the past, if you just air, it's, it's on air and that's it. But now it's online, it stays, and all the K-pop fans were usually very, very, uh, what, is the, what would be the right world? Like, if I write something that they don't like, they can be very vocal about it. So I'm a bit more mindful. So they're very passionate about it as their, their idols, right? Exactly, exactly. Right, right. So it's a lot more work for us journalists, I think. It is. But at the same time, there's a lot more interaction with, uh, with our readers and our viewers. But how has it changed your life, Kelly? I mean, I wouldn't venture to say that it changes what we cover as journalists. Um, as a freelancer, I feel like a lot of the times when I'm pitching to editors, I have to make an appeal for why this story would do well on social media, right? Because the vast majority of their consumers are probably not typing in the website anymore, but getting it on social media channels. Um, I usually have to mention some kind of visual that you know they might want to put on their Instagram or Twitter. So I think uh, now we're thinking about, at least in terms of articles or radio stories, other deliverables as well. So like, what is the Snapchat going to be or the Instagram or the tweet or what's the headline going to be? Um, I know when I first started writing, I mean, obviously social media was a thing, but um, now over the last couple of years, I feel like there's a lot more conversation about when I'm pitching, what is the headline? Like, is it going to be snappy? Is it going to be something that incites people on Twitter? So all of those things matter. Yeah, I totally agree. I was a little bit late coming to the game to journalism. I've been doing it for about a decade. But I, I, I totally agree with, with what uh, my colleagues here said. One of the uh, drawbacks of the sort of internet shift is that people are not reading long articles like they used to read. Mm -hmm or like we hope they used to read uh, in newspapers and magazines. They're reading three and four hundred words and then clicking to something else if you're lucky. Right, I mean even two or three hundred word is, is long, is too long, right, in the era of Twitter and even two minute long reports are too long, you know, 50 seconds is the short attention short span uh, right now. And of course, Korea is by no means the only place where social media is becoming a popular news platform. It's a global phenomenon seen in countries all over the world. What do you believe that are the main contributors behind the rise of social media and the usurp in traditional media as a news platform? Is uh, social media becoming a popular news provider back in your home countries as well? Oh yeah, I mean the last figure uh, in France now, uh, more than 70% of the 15 to 35 years old, their primary access news through social networks and especially Facebook. Mm -hmm. That's much bigger than, like, now, now it's really the main way to access news. And I think the reason is very simple, everybody has a smartphone, uh, everybody uses social media, few people want to pay for the news, many people seem to think the news should be free. Well, it's not. That's it's very interesting. Is it, is it Facebook in France? It's mostly Facebook, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I know that um, 
in, in general, Twitter is also another very popular source of news, right, for the general public these days? Well, I would argue Twitter, those are, are more obsessive, especially journalists. They follow Twitter and, you know, Donald Trump followers and, <laughs> and that type of thing. Those are sort of the, more the, the obsessive compulsive um, news consumers. But I would also argue that social media is not really uh, a news production platform. Mm -hmm. It's more of an echo chamber where the work that, that we do for more traditional media is being posted and linked and, and commented mm -hmm. on. But uh, it's rare that you find a Facebook journalist um, here in South Korea, particularly doing foreign correspondence. They're working for other news organizations and their production is being linked and commented on by people on social media. Right, right. And we need to sort of analyze it within that context and not get too worried, I think, about um, the production of those legacy media organizations and responsible journalism being that usurped in that that area. Um, I think still there and will always be a role for the full-time professional journalists to produce the news that, that the majority of people are, are consuming and, and commenting on. Well, good to know and very comforting to no, as a journalist. I mean, I feel like it's tough because we, there's like this ideal, but then there's also the reality we live in. Like I've always been someone that embraces social media. I actually qu find it quite satisfying. The feedback loops that right. I get on my work, mm -hmm. the engagement mm -hmm. on, um, I get on Instagram from people who watch me or listen to me or read my stuff. Um, it makes it feel like my job is more worthwhile. Um, I used to work as a social media editor in Boston, and so it's one news organization, doesn't speak to all of them, but um, the vast majority of our social media traffic came from Facebook, and when it was Twitter, I think it averaged around three to six yeah. percent of our social media driven um, traffic. So to Frank's point, I actually think that Twitter is more so a microcosm of news junkies mm -hmm. and yeah. influencers, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Right. Uh, whereas Facebook is more for like the common man. Like my yeah. mom is on Facebook, yeah. right, mm -hmm. sharing news articles. Um, so it's, it's a tough thing and it puts us in a weird position because it used to be that news companies set the agenda for what was out there. You know, people would open up the newspaper, turn on the broadcast, and it's like, here's what we decided. Uh, matters, but it's not really like that anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, we obviously still set the agenda as journalists, but it's not up to us what goes viral or what um, my cousin shares with me on Facebook that I then share um, that spins out of control. So in a weird way, it's almost like we're getting news more from our social networks than ever before, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, in another study this time conducted in the US, politics and news channels came in second overall behind video games as the most popular content on YouTube. Politics and news-related YouTube channels have also enjoyed a surge in popularity here in Korea as well. In your view, what are the main factors behind the rise in popularity of political YouTube channels here in Korea? Conservatives in Korea say that after a change in government, when the big government became liberal, they didn't have access enough to the mainstream media. I mean, this is a criticism you hear a lot. Uh, they say like, oh, uh, like, and, and this is true that when there is a change of government, incredibly, the main TV channels, the president is changed to be, is replaced by somebody who is closer to the new administration. And somehow, like the, the fact that because of this conservative politician and these conservative voices thought they could not appear on mainstream media, then they created their own channel, which is a problem because now uh, I think debate is very healthy for democracy, for society. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the fact that um, they they're, 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 there is no debate anymore. You have some people on the mainstream channel and then the more conservative, more conservative voices are talking to themselves without any contradiction. And that creates, like, you see more and more conspiracy theorists, you see people with very wacky uh, opinions. Uh, and that contributes to radicalize the opinion. And, to, right. and I think that's extremely problematic. But what uh, you're saying is basically uh, conservatives uh, going, to, uh, going online, going to YouTube, and talking to themselves, um, arguing their arguments, and that creates radicalism, right? Exactly. Yeah. Sure, and I think YouTube is kind of given to that, um, and the nature of news is given to that. Uh, people sometimes say, oh, news today, journalism today is, is in the toilet or something like that. Well, journalism hasn't been far um, from the bathroom since it was created. <laughs> uh, and there have been those problems of sensationalism 
you know, for a century. Mm. It, we're seeing that, I think, exacerbated um, by YouTube and the internet because you can reach a small subculture of radicals um, very easily. And that's what you see happening. That dissatisfaction that people have with the mainstream media is moving people online, as, as Fred mentioned. And I think that's a very positive development to give people that voice because free speech shouldn't be held up um, by gatekeepers. And I think sometimes legacy media especially does that. But again, this appeal to radicals is something that uh, I think is problematic. Now, is this uh, unique to Korea, or do you see this in your home countries as well? In France, we do have politicians very big on YouTube. There is one called Mélenchon, and he was uh, dubbed like the YouTube star of uh, French politicians. He's a very left politician. And his strategy, I think, is pretty smart. He's a very good orator. Like, he, when he speaks, he's, he's, a, he's a very interesting guy to listen to. Uh, and he has his channel for his loyal base, uh, where he can have space and time to explain his view, but it still appears a lot on traditional media. It's just a dual strategy. And I, I do, I mean, I do listen to him sometimes. It's interesting to, to listen to his views. You have that in, in the United States and in Canada. I, I'll use the example, pretty well-known example of Alex Jones and Infowars and his sort of conspiracy theoricism that gets out there and, and draws, again, a huge audience, high production value broadcasting being done um, on YouTube. And then in Canada, a, a much smaller sort of uh, individual named Stefan Molyneux. And this gets into, again, the, this problem of, of radicals and the idea of, of free speech. Now, the fellow that I mentioned, he is you know, a so-called philosopher. And if you listen to what he says, in snippets of it that appears very logical. And, it, and what's happening on these media channels is that content is being absorbed and radicals are being groomed. When we thought about free speech or when the ideal of free speech was really developed, it was developed when people could stand on a soapbox and speak to an audience or in a crowded theater, say the word fire, and that would be defined as dangerous sort of free speech. Now those individuals have access to seven billion people. Uh, amid the rising popularity of video platforms, many traditional media outlets are also creating YouTube channels of their own to deliver news. However, there's also a large number of non-journalists who are delivering news via YouTube, and many of them enjoy a very large following of subscribers who trust them. What are your thoughts of, on the growing number of YouTube influencers who are running their own political news channels? I think um, this is what's actually the real problem against, um, as opposed to those channels that are you know, news network based. I don't really view that as a problem. I think that's a good thing. Get out there as long as there, we understand like what I think what's going to take place is there's going to be a broader sort of understanding and perhaps regulatory framework regarding the range of commentary that is um, permitted. And it's really tough as a journalist to, to say this type of thing because you think of it as curtailing free speech and that's something that really is gets the hairs on I'm sure all of our necks sort of standing up. But when hate speech is out there and treads that line, it has a different impact than it did when the ideals of, of free speech were developed. One of the problems I think is a, what you call the bubble effect. You, you, you're in your bubble. Uh, when you watch mainstream channel, you will, be, you will have access to different uh, opinions and different sources. If you access your news only through YouTube, then you will basically uh, listen to opinions of people like uh, the same opinion that people around you are saying. So this is extremely problematic. I mean, it's not a matter of free speech. It's a matter of because of the, the way the system is working, you don't have access anymore to other views. I mean, I feel like there are actually some pretty easy solutions. I know, for instance, one issue with Facebook is that when you see a Facebook headline or a Facebook article, they all look exactly the same. And you have to see in that tiny, like very light gray font on the bottom, the shortened URL to know where it's coming from. So all the time I'll see something that looks like something juicy and I'll look at it and be like, I've never heard of that media organization. Then I to go an extra step and Google them and figure out who they are before I even want to click on that, right? Mm -hmm. Like there are design choices that these platforms can make without creating some kind of weird accredited list of media that like we trust, you know what I mean? Because then you run 
into the danger of ruling out grassroots media that also provide good content. Mm. Um, I don't think it should all be on the consumer, but at the same time, I think people need to understand, like at least at Bloomberg, like everything I do has to be fact checked. If something's wrong, I get in big trouble. Like we are employed, we could get fired. Like that's not the case for a YouTuber, right? Or someone writing a random article that gets shared on Facebook and looks like my article, mm -hmm. but that person has no consequences if they're wrong. Digital journalism and social media are now being considered as a viable alternative to traditional media. On the other hand, some critics say that it's become a hotbed of fake news. So do you agree with the notion that social media such as YouTube and uh, Facebook have become popular means to disseminate fake news? Absolutely, oh, yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah, and how we define fake news by that ability to take facts. You can take facts, if not real facts, but disputed facts, and create a very biased and inaccurate um, depiction of reality by selectively choosing those facts and leaving out other facts and painting things in a much different way than they would be if you were there and if you saw it. So who should ultimately take responsibility when fake news and social media becomes a serious, serious issue? I think the platform themselves, and you, I, I agree with what you said, there is a pro the question of design. Uh, there, there is, I'm sure the platform, because they almost have an incentive to, the, the platform encourage clickbait as well. So you, I don't think platform like Facebook understood their responsibility and the political consequences of their policy and of, of their algorithm. There was a recent scandal of Facebook, they completely inflated the number of views of some of their advertisement and videos and so basically they cheated. And the problem is uh, many uh, companies they base their strategy, their editorial strategy on these completely fake viewership numbers. And Facebook got just a slap in the wrist. Like they, they got fined like 40 million dollars. That's nothing compared to the damage their cheating has done. I mean, I basically lost my job because oh. of that <laughs> at my last media Did organization. You? Yes, we made. Um, an incredible pivot to video. I was so proud of the work I did there. And then, um, you know, it turned out that uh, they were not able to monetize that pivot. And so uh, Kelly Casulis was unemployed for five months. And it was a shame because uh, it really does show how much power that these social media platforms have mm -hmm. over news organizations when they're already suffering and vying for attention anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it was a slap on the wrist and I'm yeah. sure it affected many other publications. I mean, Vox, which is a major uh, news organization in the States, laid off a ton of people. They were pretty much like known for their social video content, mm -hmm. right? So it's just this constant um, cycle of trying to do what's the most popular. And I, am, I think we are, as journalists, somewhat at the mercy of it. And I also think there's a feedback loop where it creates distrust in the media as well. I can't tell you how many times I've seen internet comments that's like, oh, the liberal New York Times didn't cover this. Uh, they absolutely did. It just wasn't in your Facebook feed yeah. <laughs> because that's not what your friends are sharing, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's a very multifaceted problem and we are truly at the mercy of social media. And so right. The yellow dollar sign on YouTube has stirred controversy among content creators in recent years. Any videos that have been tagged with the yellow dollar sign are deemed controversial and not suitable for all advertisers. Uh, they can only generate income from a limited number of ads. Meanwhile, Facebook, the world's largest social networking service, recently announced that it will launch a news tap feature, a dedicated news section that will allow publishers to syndicate their headlines and articles. Do you believe YouTube's yellow dollar sign in Facebook's new news tab, where human editors filter out and curate and news contents are necessary features? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think we're going to really see again this debate about what is free speech being played out more as we move forward and grapple uh, with the challenges of, sp of free speech um, online that we haven't really grappled with yet. And you can see that because different countries have different definitions of what free speech is, especially in, in terms of more sort of um, let's say totalitarian governments or free speech restrictive governments and those that have uh, a wider definition um, of free speech. But uh, do you believe these new features restrict uh, free expression on social media? No? I mean, there's always this danger that certain media organizations or stories are gonna be favored 
by these human filters. I mean, I, maybe it's because I'm Asian American, but my first question is, okay, who's filtering this? Is it all white people? <laughs> uh, like, you know what I mean? A room uh, full of. <laughs> right, so I, I have these questions. I know for me, there are certain news publications that I don't necessarily trust 100% of the time. I wouldn't even call them news publications. I would call them more so blogs for like Asian Americans or African Americans in the United States where everything I read on them, I take uh, with a grain of salt, but I will often find a week or two later that they end up in a legacy news organization like the LA Times because someone there put in the time yeah. of day. It would be an absolute shame if we lost some of that. I know I myself have seen things on these um, blogs and have like called the LAPD <laughs> myself because because I want to know, is it true? Did someone beat up like a Haimani, like a Korean grandma in LA K-Town? Do you know what I mean? Um, most people aren't going to do that, but that doesn't mean that there's not a value for these non-legacy publications. And as someone who worked at a publication in the States that was not a legacy publication, but had quite rigorous editorial standards, mm -hmm. um, I found it quite frustrating because we couldn't get into Google News. Right, mm -hmm. which is a major for people reaching our content. Mm -hmm. But why is that? We were a legitimate publication with seasoned journalists and uh, very rigorous editorial standards. So I fear, and I'm not against them, but I'm, I fear that these tools could kind of create the similar issue where we're kind of, again, favoring these legacy publications uh, that are so far immune to layoffs. And then the smaller ones that maybe provide a different value get kind of closed out. Now, social media's influence is growing to the point where popular YouTubers have now made the jump to traditional media, such as television. What are your thoughts on influential YouTubers who are now making television and radio appearances on the back of their online popularity? I mean, it shows that the traditional media is not dead yet, right? There's still legacy media still provide legitimacy and uh, exposure. And Again, comforting to know. <laughs> yeah. I think it shows that uh, a little bit on the other side of the same coin mm -hmm. is that legacy media has gatekeepers that are not accurately you know, um, bringing in the talent to appear on the air that people want to see. Mm. And YouTube yeah. provides this platform for somebody that has the talent, that has a perspective, whether they're, you know, a magician or a comedian or a news producer. It gives them a pl platform to reach an audience that is thirsting for their content. Mm. And when you see them gravitate onto legacy media, it's confirmation of the value uh, of that platform to give somebody with zero money down an opportunity to, to speak to a wider audience than, than ever before. I mean, on the opposite end of things, uh, when I see like a famous YouTuber go on like, I don't know, like an LA TV station, which is a high market TV station, part of me feels like it's the TV station winning out in that sense, because I feel like a lot of the problem with legacy television, at least, is that it's just so old school. Like, I don't, um, I, I think my generation doesn't really want to see someone in a suit um, talking like this in that really strange metered voice that worked in the 1940s. And so that there's this weird stiffness going on with legacy media that needs to change. I mean, I used to work in a graphics department uh, a little bit for uh, a major market uh, TV station in the US and it's just like, it just felt like I was living in the 80s. Like the graphics, the, the style, everything. And I was just like, no wonder why young people don't watch this, yeah. right? It's not just because it's not on YouTube all the yeah. time. It's also because it kind of sucks. And <laughs> so I do think um, stylistically, like we need to think about how we're gonna change uh, the major broadcasters in legacy media to be a little more hip. And sometimes I think they're actually the ones winning out by bringing the YouTubers and the personalities and the Instagram influencers on air, to be honest. All right, so <laughs> final question. If you could summarize our discussion today into um, a headline. I would say uh, creating a healthy media environment is crucial for democracy. Very French. <laughs> I like it. Um, I would probably say, like, YouTube is a platform, not a news organization. Still needs to take responsibility. Mm. Journalism under social media fire. 
Mm, <laughs> nice. Well, uh, that wraps up our discussion today on the political influence of social media. We'll be back next week for another discussion on the latest issues. So don't forget to tune in then. Thank you for watching and goodbye.